there are two clear impressions that I have of Rogers, and one is of the charismatic man, the actor, the man with that sort of politician's capacity to remember who you are. Roger would step out of the lift, bristling with bonhomie, and say, I haven't seen you around here before, young man. Chat, 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 where are you stationed? Yada, yada, yada. And you think, wow, the golden boy of the CIB um, is paying attention. He likes me. Isn't that wonderful? Um, that was all fabulous. But the flip side of Rogerson that I saw is the fact that he's just an evil, murderous bastard. Welcome back to Court in the Act. For a certain time, in certain places, New South Wales detective Roger Rogerson was a legend within his own ranks. Old school and not one of the new breed. So regarded at that time that in the late 70s and early 80s, some even saw him as a possible future police commissioner. Admired by colleagues and feared by crooks, even in the notorious Sydney underworld. Rogerson scooped up robbers, shot up bad guys, solved murders and never said sorry. But he also committed murders, several of them, and never showed any remorse for those either. A serial killer with a badge is one label that's stuck. Australia's most corrupt cop is another. And Australia's most notorious corrupt policeman, Roger Rogerson, has died. Those and flattering eulogies came after Rogerson died following a fatal medical episode in Sydney's Long Bay Prison late last month. With Rogerson's death behind bars, aged 83, one of the most notorious law enforcement chapters of this country was finally buried, along with many secrets, including from here in Western Australia. Because along with being one of the most infamous Sydney coppers, Rogerson had also cast iron links to the West forged in the mid-70s as part of a mentoring program which saw him share his ways with the WA's best boys in blue. And while he happened to be on one of those trips to Perth, one of the most notorious murders of that era occurred, with his name right in the middle of it. Joining me this week to explore the life and crimes of Roger Rogerson is Duncan McNabb, former detective, private investigator, investigative journalist and author of a shelf full of books, including one called Roger Rogerson, From Decorated Policeman to Convicted Criminal, The Inside Story. Duncan, thanks so much for joining us on Court in the Act this week. My pleasure. So, firstly, let me ask you, you were a police officer and crossed paths with Rogerson on the job. So after seeing him in action and up close and having written now two books on him, what is your lasting impression? There are two clear impressions that I have of Rogerson. One is of the charismatic man, the actor, the man with that sort of politician's capacity to remember who you are, that little snippet. So when he shakes your hands, looks you in the eye, asks how the wife and kids are or hey, something else is going on, you feel this guy is pretty special. And he did that to young detectives, as I was at the Criminal Investigation Branch headquarters in Sydney, way back in, she was early 80s, 81-ish. Um, <clears throat> Roger would step out of the lift, bristling with bonhomie, and say, I haven't seen you around here before, young man. Chat, 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 where are you stationed? Yada, yada, yada. And you think, wow, the golden boy of the CIB um, is paying attention. He likes me. Isn't that wonderful? Um, that was all fabulous. But the flip side of Rogerson that I saw is... The fact that he's just an evil, murderous bastard. So, so corrupt, but yep. at the same time feared and revered, even into his dotage. Um, so what do you what do you think ultimately made him Rogerson what he became, which was, you know, rotten to the core, basically. Um, I often chat with a mate of mine who's a criminal psychologist who's been dabbling with crooks since the late seventies. And I take his counsel on these, these things. He said, basically, some people are just born bad and then they get an opportunity. And I think that's the case with Roger Rogerson. He had a lovely family. Um, terrific, caring parents, brother and sister. I've met the brother. Lovely bloke. Very capable copper, very honest. Whose career was ruined because of a surname. Um, so in this decent, you know, by lower middle class, a hard working class family in Sydney's Bankstown, 
Um, every dollar they make goes into supporting the family. Mum goes to church once or twice every Sunday. That's where Roger sort of honed his musical theatre skills in church playing the piano and the organ. Um, he had everything in his favour to turn out to be a good cop, a decent, honourable bloke. But Roger, very quickly into his police career, and I think by the towards the mid to late sixties, had chosen the path that he ended up taking. Um, he first came into contact with the uh, elite of the CIB, which was you know, some great detectives and some spectacularly great crooks. When he was a very, very young detective, which sort of make the T do the typing, um, investigation to a guy called the murder of Pretty Boy Walker, um, and Roger. Came under notice as some senior detectives at that point. Um, they realised that he was capable, probably quite fearless, and would pretty much do as he was asked to do, which, whether good or bad or otherwise, Roger would do it, no questions, trustworthy. A bloke who would load up, that's an old fashioned expression for falsifying, it, falsifying an admission, for example, or unsigned records of interviewers, Roger was quite good at. He was a great playwright. Um, but I think those skills were earmarked fairly early in his police career. And I suspect blokes like this, the senior somewhat bed coppers, saw in Rogerson someone they could groom into into themselves, the next generation. Relentless, fearless, good investigators, uh, people who would do anything to get a conviction, but also at the same time, people who didn't, making, didn't mind making a dollar on the way through either. Um, and I think in Rogerson, they found pretty much their next generation. And Roger mm. was quite amenable to that as well. Um, and sending a bloke like that to the armed hold-up squad, which is probably one of his long-term postings in the New South Wales Police Force, meant they've given him keys, if you're crooked, to a gold mine. So, as Duncan's just outlined for us, uh, Rogerson was born in Bondi, 1941, joined the police as a cadet as a 17-year-old, um, despite the fact, I understand, that his father didn't have much... Uh, uh, much time for the coppers because he was a he was a communist himself. Uh, began his career in Bankstown, close to home. Um, caught the eye of his seniors, as Duncan's just said, and uh, won a spot in the plainclothes ranks in 1962. And from there, onto the special crime squad, the A team of detectives working the city's biggest jobs. As Duncan said, the murder of Robert, a pretty boy, Walker. Uh, the first, apparently, in Australia where the murder weapon was a machine gun. The murder of 14-year-old schoolgirl Maureen Bradley, who was abducted as she walked home from school in 1971. He even helped to investigate the fire at the Whiskey A Go Go nightclub in Queensland, which ended up with the death of 15 people. After a decade rising the ranks, Rogerson was then transferred to the armed hold-up squad, otherwise known as the Stick-Ups. Trained up and then tooled up, the squad battled the epidemic of armed robberies around the city, with their weapon of choice being a barrage of Remington 870 12-gauge shotguns. If you get hit with SG 932 caliber lead balls in every round, you will not be home for tea. That was Rogers Rogerson writing in his own autobiography. From 1976 to 1985, nine armed robbers were shot dead by that squad. Two of them, Rogerson claimed, died by his hand. A third died while he was present. In 1976, at Avoca Beach on the New South Wales Central Coast, bank robber Philip Weston died in a hail of bullets as he climbed out of a window trying to escape. In 1978, after a tip-off, Rogerson and others shot dead Lawrence Butchie Byrne as he attempted to rob the South Sydney Junior Leagues Club of its Saturday night takings. And in August 1979, Rogerson was there when drug addict and bank robber Gordon Thomas was gunned down in Roach Bay. During his time in the stick-ups, Rogerson became the pin-up, the hero cop taking bad guys out on Sydney's mean streets. 13 Bravery Awards and the Peter Mitchell Award, the most prestigious award a member of the state police force could get for collaring three armed robbers wanted for multiple crimes, including murder. That was awarded in 1980, by which time Rogerson had met and eagerly cultivated his relationship with an informant known to be often armed 
and always dangerous. Neddy Smith. Duncan, this meeting between these two has been categorised as a seminal moment in Australian criminal history and not in a good way. So who was Neddy Smith and why was he so dangerous? Um, Arthur Neddy Smith, to give it, Neddy was his nickname. Neddy Smith was um, pretty much a one-man crime wave. Um, a war baby, I think his mother was uh, unaware of who his father was. He grew up in Redfern and Sydney's inner city, which in those days was quite reasonably called a slum. Awful part of the world back then. These days, quite fashionable. Um, his mother was not terribly, not around all that often. He, his grandmother looked after him and she was quite violent. He also had a violent elder brother who I think at one stage he stabbed. And Nettie was just <laughs> bad news from the day he first drew his first breath. And it was conspicuous. Um, criminal record fairly early on. I think he spent a chunk of his childhood in um, some of those appalling uh, children's homes that they sent people to back in those days where mm -hmm. uh, a violent, problematic child was sent to a place that was even more violent and problematic, sexual assaults, all that sort of stuff. Um, my recollection was Nettie got out of, out of about the age of 16 and promptly set up business in Sydney's King's Cross running prostitutes. Mm -hmm. He was a pimp. Um, the rest of his life, he was just in and out of jail for crimes of violence, a rapist, um, a murderer, um, a drug dealer. At one point, he was reputed to be Australia's largest heroin dealer. Mm -hmm. um, and he also committed, he was a prolific armed robber which is what drew him into Roger's orbit um, on that fateful day, I think in October 76, when Neddy comes to report at a police station on bail. Not an uncommon occurrence back in those days. You come in, mm. the police cite you, make sure you're upright, get you to sign the card, and off you go home again. Um, <clears throat> the um, hold-up squad wanted to have a long chat to Neddy and a couple of his other mates about, I think, remember, it was a payroll robbery. So rather than walk out of the police station after signing off, he was introduced to a uh, sparkling young Detective Rogerson, I think it was about 33 back in those days. Mm -hmm. So these two young fellows met. It's, and you're right, it was a seminal moment in Australian criminal history and for all the wrong reasons. These are two blokes that really should have been kept well and truly away from me. <laughs> um, in Roger, very much on the make, very keen to get inside the criminal element even more deeply so he could get the tip-offs as an informant that he needed to be mm -hmm. successful. And also, as Roger later, we later found out, through, particularly through the Blue Murder and Nettie Smith's own writings, Roger was very keen to go into business. He loved the idea of cash, and he also loved the idea of being in control. And with Rogerson, I always think the money was always important. Rogerson was reputed, even into his later moments before he went inside, as having very short arms and very deep pockets. Trying <laughs> to get a round of beer out of him was hard work. Um, the prospect of the cash was always good, but I think it was the power that he had to get that cash. So you've got this combination of greed and ego, um, pretty terrifying. And then Rogerson, who was pretty average physical build, um, strong and wiry, I think you'd probably call it, um, and not averse to physical work. He was a hard-working bucket throughout his entire life. Uh, and then he meets this, um, I suppose you'd politely call Nettie the size of a brick shithouse. I mean, he's yeah. six foot five, six foot six, built like you wouldn't believe, muscles for days, incredibly violent and utterly unpredictable. And mm. also greedy, and he also wanted someone like Roger. The two were unfortunately perfect for each other and unfortunate for anyone who came in their path. Yeah. So in 1981, Roger Rogerson and death become reacquainted, the death being of drug dealer Warren Lanfranchi. It is the first of what Duncan has described as a holy trinity of murders linked with Rogerson but never pinned on him. And it is the moment where Rogerson's bullet-riddled halo slipped and his true nature began to emerge. In May 1981, Lam Frankie made a bad decision by ripping off a rival heroin dealer of $37,000 worth of drugs. He knew he was in trouble when he found out that the dealer was connected to Smith and Rogerson. And so a reparation meeting of sorts was arranged with Smith ordered by Rogerson to bring Lan Frankie to him. Rogerson also brought along 18, 18 fellow police officers, many of whom witnessed the detective shoot Lan Frankie twice, in the neck and in the heart. I want you to take a look at this and tell me what's fact and what's fiction. Roger, this is Warren Lan Frankie. Rogerson. Hello, Warren. 
ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. This shows Lan Franchi walking across unarmed. Unarmed, that's right, exactly. And then. And is that how it was, though? No, he was armed. I mean, he was armed, and he had the firearm was in his hand when he ended up in the gutter. Rogerson later swore on oath Lan Franchi was about to fire on him. His fellow officers backed him up, but. Lan Frankie's girlfriend, Sally Ann Huckstep, told a different story, that Warren had been unarmed and had $10,000 in cash on him to make good on the heroin theft. She told that story to the media repeatedly, insisting Lan Frankie had gone to the meeting unarmed, had been robbed and murdered. Did Warren try to take his gun that Saturday morning or Saturday lunchtime? Oh, God, no. How do you know, Sally, that he didn't have a gun in the car, that he didn't pick it up on the, the path as he walked out, that he didn't have it planted somewhere? Because he left the gun at home and I had the gun. It was a 9mm Smith & West automatic pistol. In 1986, Huck Stepp's strangled remains were found in a pond in Centennial Park. The second of the Trinity was another woman linked to Lan Frankie. Sometime model and part-time sex worker Lynn Woodward knew him and knew Sally Ann Huckstep. The two women became friends and when Lan Frankie died, Woodward was willing to tell what she knew. She first made some recorded allegations that Rogerson was a major heroin dealer, that Rogerson had given her drugs to secure friendly testimony. And then she gave preliminary evidence in person to the Lan Frankie inquest in late 1981. She was told she would be required the next day. But she never came back and was never seen again. The third of the Trinity was the killing of Mr. Rentakill, a gangster called Chris Flannery. As his nickname would suggest, Flannery was a contract killer. As well as that, he was an armed robber, and not a very good one if his criminal career here in Perth was a marker. On the run from Melbourne, Flannery had fled west and got a job in the men's department of David Jones in Perth. But when the manager got wind of Flannery's past, he fired him. So Flannery went back next day and robbed the place. He then ran to Sydney, was nabbed there and charged by Detective Roger Rogerson. And that was the beginning of the fatal attraction between the two. Their paths crossed again years later when Flannery was asked by an old friend after an undercover job on a heroin deal. The undercover cop who caught him was the cop that Duncan mentioned earlier, Mick Drury. So, Williams asked Flannery if Rogerson would bribe Drury to drop the case. Mick Drury refused. So, Williams asked Flannery and Rogerson if they would kill Drury. In June 1984, Chris Flannery gunned Mick Drury down in his own home, while Rogerson sat in a car nearby, listening in on the radio. Miraculously, Drury survived, and surprisingly, Flannery did not, disappearing not long after his home had also been sprayed with bullets. Duncan, the shooting of Mick Drury was one of the last things Chris Flannery did, it's believed, and many are convinced he was retired by Roger Rogerson because he was becoming a liability. Yeah, uh, the public, Flannery and Rogerson had sort of been in each other's orbit for a couple of years, um, and Flannery was up in, he'd moved, to, Flannery's decided that Melbourne wasn't a big enough town for him, so he took his uh, murderous business to Sydney, brought his family and a couple of, wife and a couple of kids up, settled them in Arncliffe, uh, which is just near Sydney International Airport. Mm -hmm. um, the, and then Flannery started big noting himself around town, and that's, he sort of came very quickly to Rogerson's orbit. Curious enough, Flannery was also, I think, on bail for a lot of that period for a murder of a guy called Raymond the Lizard Loxley, a Sydney, <laughs> a Sydney um, yeah, pimp brothel keeper who had been told to go to Melbourne because Sydney, if he, if he hung around Sydney, the cops might uh, get pretty aggressive towards it. Complete hustle. 
Um, <laughs> Flannery was sort of had been charged with his murder and been extradited back to Sydney and so on. So it, anyway, Flannery's fallen a bit in love with Sydney because he thinks it's a place of great opportunity. So he's trying to inveigle himself into the more notable Krems around town, like George Freeman, who was a substantial bookmaker, ran casinos, Lenny McPherson, who was also a Rogerson informant at one stage, who was also notably the, called the Mr. Big of Crime. Um, so Flannery's mucking around Sydney. He's accepting contracts for uh, bashings. At one stage, he's caught on tape. Very fledgling days of car phones, uh, <laughs> when they're about as big as the boot. He's having a conversation with notable Sydney medical practitioner, Dr. Jeffrey Yellowston, who later went, became quite famous for uh, opening up medical centres with chandeliers and pianos and all that sort of stuff. And uh, the, the famous uh, appearance at the Brownlow Medal with a wife that wasn't wearing much at all from, yes. from memory. It, yeah, at one stage he owned the Sydney Swans. Yep. Uh, yes, his wife was noted for her brief, well, well, her frugality of fabric. <laughs> um, and all of his wives and or girlfriends always looked the same. Jeff was sort of short, somewhat dumpy, and a um, lot older. Anyway, but Jeffy had an ego, which was massive. So Edelson and Flannery having conversations. The kind of conversation just went along the lines of Jeff was having some problems with people who weren't paying. And Flannery uh, asked him what Flannery could do, and Flannery says, you know, for $10,000, a bashing, for $50,000, I'll kill him. And Edelson is somewhat thrifty and comes back and says, $10,000, that's a lot of money for a bashing. And Flannery says, well, baseball bats are expensive. <laughs> that's the sort of bloke he was, a complete lair. His criminal history was is been dubious. Again, he comes from a really nice, decent, honourable family. His brother was one of a notable barrister in Melbourne for years. Mum's lovely, sister's lovely. Chris just turns out to be bad. Very early on, he gets involved in that Melbourne underbelly. A lot of them actually turn up in the numerous underbelly things. Mm -hmm. um, Chris is in jail fairly early on. He ends up in Pentridge at uh, H Block, which is, I think, the most notorious of the notorious. Um, he doesn't learn his lesson. And eventually he gets... He, he Actually, one of his early contracts was to murder a solicitor, I think, called Roger Wilson. Um, they kidnap, they pretend they're coppers. They hire, they hire up a Ford Falcon and they put on safari suits. They capture Roger Wilson. Um, they cart him off somewhere and murder him. Uh, they then bury his body not terribly far from Wilson's farm. Flattery is... Where, and this, this is similarly where Rogerson also started to accelerate his downfall. Flannery is called upon by one of the evening seven o'clock current affair things like a current affair of today, not whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And he pops up to talk about Melbourne crime and he's looking at a million dollars and he's bragging about this, that, and the other. And one of, I think it was Wilson's farm manager, looks at him and says, I remember you. You were the bloke who was coming around our job pretending to be a real estate salesman. And the whole thing, uh, the cops put two or two together. They come up with all this sort of stuff. Roger Wilson has never been found. But they think that well, one of the coppers told me that they think when all this hit the fan at Flannery and his mates are arrested for the murder, that Alphonse Gertrude the other notable underbelly character in Melbourne, is compelled to go out and dig up the body and relocate it. Um, so that's Chris Flannery, a busy crock, but not a good one. He comes to Sydney. <laughs> And he's starting to play with Rogers and Nettie Smith and that crowd. He's always on the edge. Um, but when he's contracted to kill Mick Drury, which happens over a civilised dinner, by the way, um, he buggers it up. He shoots Drury twice, but Drury doesn't die. Hmm. Um, I'm told by one of my great sources that Flannery then runs to Dremoyne in the inner city and hides out there until things cool down slightly. Drury survives. Um the New South Wales, a senior member of the New South Wales Police Force called Angus MacDonald, who is now no longer with us, um, is charged to take on the inquiry and to see what happened. Not helped by the fact that Angus was also a mate of Rogerson. So mm. you can, the inquiry was mm, long, complicated, and surprisingly enough, went absolutely nowhere. Mm. But by early 1985, Flannery is getting decidedly ratty. His, um, his coke use has gone through the roof. He's paranoid. People have taken pot shots at him in the front lawn of his house, so he's wound up tighter than you all get out. So he's declining rapidly. Uh, Rogerson, I believe, thinks that he's becoming dangerous. I mean, he's the only... Nettie Smith is rock solid. Alan Williams is not rock solid. Christopher Flannery is going off the deep end, and he knows that Rogerson was responsible for Drury's shooting. Hmm. So it's becoming a bit complicated. 
Chris is becoming what Roger described as a pest. Um, and so Roger decided to become the pest exterminator. The fact of a senior detective not only sanctioning, but actually it's seemingly participating in the attempted murder of another police officer. That, that, that is extraordinary in itself. But it's that it, it, it also, doing the reading, it's also extraordinary that it, 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 it's what, it's that that took um, Rogerson's people or Rogerson's you know, colleagues to finally turn on him and think, nah, he's, he's actually quite bad. Yeah, but they'd been sort of slowly getting him out Sliding of Sliding away, yeah. Yeah, it was, a, it was. I think the pivotal moment was a Lanfranchi murder. Uh, mm. Sorry, the shooting of Warren Lanfranchi. Yes. Um, <laughs> killed him, Stone did. I mean, poor old Warren Lanfranchi allegedly also had a gun and they found one in his hand, surprisingly, which mm. I would suggest might arrive there shortly after it hit the pavement. Um, <laughs> I think one, one journal I made of mine who was covered in quite class, he said, the trousers, he was wearing sprayed on trousers and a sprayed on shirt. You right. could get a gun into those trousers no matter how hard you try. <laughs> anyway, um, but that happens. And it was curious. I was at the CIB at the time and Roger, people started asking questions or sort of looking a bit askance at him because Roger had done something no detective should ever do. He'd actually brought the CIB and its activities into question publicly mm. on the front mm. page of the paper, starting mm. with the Sunday Telegraph the day after the shooting. Mm. And people started asking questions, you know, that sort of, this smells a bit. Do we want to be part of this game? And I remember there was one point not long after that, coppers used to go to the pub across the road, cash their paychecks, public and it was fabulous. But everyone would have Roger as their centre of attention. They wanted to be in his circle. You know, they yep. love that rub off. Mm. And then it was oh, some time later that I remember watching it one night and Roger walks in and you could almost, almost theatrically turn their backs on it. Oh, letting wow. Roger there hand, hanging onto his schooner of rushes and looking a bit sort of what the hell's gone. Then they <laughs> booted him out of the CIB and sent him up to be a detective in Darlinghurst, which is just up the road, but covers King's Cross. So, you know, frying pans and fires come to mind. Mm. Um, but it was after the Drury stuff that he was, I think from memory, not long after the Drury deposition, Roger was suspended for a while. Um, but what, And this is the, the weird thing, and this is, sort of gets you, gives you an idea of what policing's like in those days. Roger didn't get booted for what he did with Drury. He was later charged and acquitted. But he was booted down to the New South Wales Police Force because on April the 1st, and I remember <laughs> just purely for the joke, April the 1st, 1986, he turns up to defend himself on television. Sally Ann Huckstep is incredibly brave, has been relentless in her pursuit of it for the last couple of years. Roger turns up on TV talking to Ray Martin. Mm. Um and in the course of that conversation with Ray, uh, he manages to out Nettie Smith as an informant, Lenny McPherson, Mr. Big as an informant, and then sort of stumbles his way as to why he was trying to cover up $100,000 in cash using bodged bank accounts. And he had this spurious story about how it was to restore a Bedley or some such nonsense. <laughs> um, I'm surprised he didn't say it was for the church roof or something. Oh, it, it, well, he got the idea from two of mates who were also on tape, by the way, um, a Dr. Nick Paltos and a solicitor whose name eludes me, um, who were both involved in a massive drug deal. So great combination, all on tape, thanks very much. So Roger was kicked out of the New South Wales Police Force because broadly bringing their reputation to the police force disrepute. Um <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like Al Capone being done for tax. Yeah. Uh, and that was what got him in the police force. A lot of coppers were distancing themselves from him, pretending not to know him. I've spoken to a few when I was researching books and knew him really well. I was all saying, oh, we didn't know him that well. I haven't seen him in ages. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but didn't yeah. you have lunch with him two weeks ago? Oh, I didn't know he was coming. So there's been this sort of great turnaround. So it's been an intriguing career, but, you know, he still had a lot of residual... Old, old detectives who still had residual fondness for it, you know, mm. the bloke who could get things done, a hard man in hard times. Um, yes, he was, but he was also a bloody cold-blooded killer too. Yeah. So as Duncan said, following all that fallout from that interview, the shootings, the stink that was starting to surround Roger Rogerson, he was drummed out of the force and he ended up in prison. Firstly, for perverting the course of justice, and then, again, for lying to the Police Integrity Commission. But he also ended up in demand, going on a controversial and 
actually hugely popular speaking tour with two colourful identities, Mark Jackson and Chopper Reed. They called themselves the Wild Colonial Psychos, a tag which would prove to be more than apt because in 2014, Rogerson was arrested and charged with the cold-blooded murder of a 20-year-old man at a storage facility in Padstow. And for a man who prided himself on his smarts and his police nous, the whole sordid enterprise was embarrassingly captured on CCTV at almost every step. Jamie Gow was a bright student, but he was also an aspiring drug dealer. Part of that plan involved former detective and private investigator Glenn McNamara, who he had met dozens of times. May the 20th, 2014, would be their last meeting. CCTV showed the pair arriving at the same deserted industrial estate, soon to be joined by a third man, older, shuffling with a distinctive gait, bald and wearing glasses. Three go in, but only two come out. McNamara and Roger Rogerson. McNamara can then be seen dragging a silver surfboard bag with something heavy inside. They both put that bag in a car and drive off. Two hours later, more CCTV catches the pair with a six-pack of beer. The following morning, with some fishing rods. Six days later, that bag, with Jamie Gow's body inside floats to the surface of the sea off the coast of Cronulla, along with the tarpaulin, rope and two bullet wounds in his chest and his stomach. McNamara and Rogerson were both charged with murder. Both blamed each other. A jury found them both guilty. Duncan, a, a bizarre crime and a very seedy way for Roger Rogerson to finally pay for taking a life. It, yeah, it, um, for my money, is I, I think it, the murder is the most filmed crime I've seen, and possibly in criminal history anywhere. Um, and it's why Rogerson did it. Um, I think it wasn't the money; he didn't need the cash. What Rogers and I think he would have liked to cash, mind you, a little top up for the super. Mm. But Roger is in his early seventies, uh, and I think it was very much Roger's ego driving him to do it. He thought it'd be easy. He thought it'd be profitable. But he could also Roger had a lot of swagger because in the lead up to all that, Roger was working sort of as a consigliere to organise crime. And uh, I remember chatting to some people about who knew him quite well. And Roger would hold court in a coffee shop close to his house, up the back mm. of this stylish little coffee shop. You know, the mums would go past in the morning taking their kids, get a takeaway. And then the crims would arrive in similar car, very nice four-wheel drives, immaculate dress, tatters for days, a bit of bleak. And they'd sort of, <laughs> Roger would hold court and give them advice. There was always money involved and that sort of stuff. So I think it was, it was good for Roger's ego to say oh, to all these young blokes, I've still got it. I still mm. know how to do it. Mm. Um, and, you know, pick up a couple hundred grand as well, which is not bad for a day's outing. They thought they would never be caught. Now, in Roger's case, he's a crafty, devious bastard. In McNamara's case, he's just not the sharpest tool in the shed. He's a brag of a fool, um, whose reputation as being an honest cop turned out to be complete bullshit. Mm. But where, where that went terribly, they, they planned it actually quite meticulously. And sitting through the trial, I realised how meticulous they're planning it. They, they get the faint, they get the car with the, the van 10 years. They've set everything. They get the keys to the storage and they make sure no one's there. Quite well planned. Um, I'm confident that they knew where the CCTV was at the storage unit. Uh, I think that was pretty clear. What they stuffed up is that they decided to meet Jamie Gow. Um, as you turn off the motorway to get to the rendezvous, to get to the storage unit where they do the deal, um, there's a number of small dead-end streets, small businesses, you know, little suburban factory type things. They mm -hmm. arranged to meet outside a wholesale butcher. And what McNamara is parked on one side of the road. Rogerson's on the other side of the road in his own silver, I think silver falcon wagon from memory. But what they didn't know is that the butcher had been having some problems with theft from his customers' cars. They put a little CCTV up on the roof. They didn't see that. A little tiny one. <laughs> so what they didn't know is that that kicks off. So when the police were investigating the crime, 
they do a thorough canvas of the entire area and they happen upon, I think it's mixed meats from memory, they happen upon the CCTV. They look at the CCTV and there's Jamie Gow hopping out of his car because that's all recorded by the traffic cameras. So yeah. they know where Jamie Gow is going. They've got Jamie Gow hopping out of his car, shuffling across the road and hopping into the back of McNamara station wagon. Meanwhile, Rogers is prowling past. So it's looking quite curious at this point. Mm. Um, the CCTV that activates other CCTVs all the way along the street, along the main road, traffic comes bang, 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 and then into the self-storage unit where the other CCTV picks it up. Beautifully done. So that's all picked up, and they pick up Jamie Gow being dragged out in the tarpaulin or the boogie bag, thrown in the back of the car. Then they seek way to, sh- having worked out at that point who the crims were, there is that incredible moment. Now, I was sitting in court when they played CCTV, and we go to Glenn's garage. We've been down to the, uh, the, uh, the local uh, hire place so they could hire a block and tackle because they couldn't quite lift Jamie into the back of the boat. So that's all on tape. They've got the tra- the cams inside the garage have picked it up. And then we have the moment you just spoke about. You could hear the oxygen almost being yeah. sucked in as the vision of these two blokes who just murdered somebody and worked on disposing his body, hop into a lift with a six-pack of beer like they were just going up hard day's thirst. And the entire courtroom goes, oh. And then the next morning, I think they're caught on CCTV at the boat ramp. Yeah. Um, all because they failed to pick up one little traffic camera had they been thorough, had they been alert, they may have seen it, and we would have had a different story. And I, I, and incredibly, Duncan, the actual discovery of Jamie Gow's body was even captured on film by one of the fishermen who found it. And uh, it, it, it just, it's just an astonishingly modern uh, uh, crime done by some very old school <laughs> crooks. Yes, the, the dinosaurs don't last well, apparently. Uh, and Roger also did something else, and I won't go into the gory details, but an experienced detective, or two experienced detectives, should have known how to dispose of a body at sea better. Mm. There are some basics that you pick up around the traps, and I won't admit it's too grisly, mm. but there are some things that you should have done that they both failed to do completely, which is why Jamie Gow didn't go to the bottom, which is why Jamie Gow rose up and scared those poor bloody fishermen that morning. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, it's just horrifying. But that was, again, an absolute failure. One old detective I know quipped and said, Roger's just a cheap bastard. He just couldn't be bothered to put put any other weights. He was too cheap. And we now know, sorry, uh, we now know that after, you know, failing on in, in his appeals, that meant Rogerson, well, Roger Rogerson spent the rest of his days uh, in, in prison. And you said, you said off uh, just before we started recording that he was actually quite busy, even inside. Yeah, and Roger was pretty much in prison from a couple of, within the first week after Jamie Gow's murder back in May. Um, he was sought after. He, I think, came across to Perth to talk. Uh, to, sorry, he was on audio link to. Uh, he was either interviewed or gave evidence. I'm not sure which. At the Shirley Finn inquiry in Perth, the brothel keeper who was murdered. Um, he was also gave evidence by video link to the investigators for the Whiskey A Go Go fire up in. Brisbane. Um, and just before um, he died, he was a potential witness into an inquiry into the um, alleged wrongful conviction of the Croatian Six in Sydney. Roger was one of the lead detectives in the case, um, but the court couldn't get him to, to give evidence because of his declining medical condition. So um, that he also had, of course, two appeals running, one to the Court of Criminal Appeal, which failed, subsequently one to the High Court. And just as a quirk, he managed to invite me out for a chat at one point as well, which was interesting, but marveling. So, a lifetime of secrets and lies, death and corruption. They all followed Roger Rogerson. But, as Duncan's just mentioned, did he also bring them to Perth in June 1975? On the morning of the 23rd of that month, a white Dodge Phoenix with a black vinyl roof was parked at a weird angle near the green fairways of Royal Perth Golf Club. Inside, wearing a breathtaking ball gown, was a brothel madam called Shirley Finn. It was her car, and she died in it from the four bullets someone had shot into her head. She was 34 years old, a mother, and had obviously been brutally and efficiently murdered. 
by whom has been a question unanswered for nearly 50 years, despite numerous investigations, internal inquiries, and eventually a public inquest. It was in that forum in 2017 that Roger Rogerson was officially linked to the Shirley Finn case by various witnesses, including former WA police officers. Former brothel Madam Linda Watson told the inquest her information was Rogerson had flown into WA as a mechanic or a FIFO killer and had something to do with Finn's murder. Michael Regan, a uniformed officer in the 1960s, told how he was tasked to drive more senior detectives around at times and remembered Rogerson in his car and being dropped at the Raffles Hotel. That famous waterside watering hole at that time was owned by Abe Saffron, a Sydney crime boss known colloquially all over the country as Mr Sin. And Mr Regan also said he was certain Rogerson was close with fellow WA detective and head of the vice squad Bernie Johnson, who he said was also head of a purple circle of corrupt WA detectives. He had even driven them around Perth together. CIB detective Laurie Tyler told the coroner he too knew Bernie Johnson, knew of Abe Saffron, and had even been introduced to Rogerson a couple of times in the WA police canteen. And Mr Tyler said around the time of Miss Finn's murder, he went for a drink at the Raffles Hotel, where he saw Abe Saffron, Bernie Johnson and Roger Rogerson enjoying each other's hospitality. I thought that was something to take note of, Mr Tyler said to the inquest. And there was much more to note. Like the evidence of former WA fraud squad detective James Boland. He told the inquest about information he was given a month after Ms Finn's murder. His arrest of one man, Boland remembered, had led to that man's partner offering a deal. Information about Shirley Finn in exchange for reduced charges. Detective Boland listened. The information was that a hitman had been hired from over east to kill Miss Finn for a bounty of $5,000. The assassin flew into Perth under an assumed name, invited Miss Finn out for a drink, which she accepted because she fancied him. That man then lured her to Perth Airport and killed her on the way. And the name of that alleged hitman? Arthur Neddy Smith. A huge break in the case, a potential killer and a motive. And then nothing. Coroner Barry King, in delivering his reasons, revealed that no significant follow-up of that information was conducted by WA Police until 2015, 40 years later. That demonstrated that there was potentially pivotal evidence obtained by police and retained on the relevant investigation record, but that either nothing of any consequence was done to follow it up, or if anything was done, it was not recorded, the coroner said. At an early stage of the inquest, it demonstrated the possibility that police corruption existed in the CIB at the time of Ms Finn's murder. Those eventual follow-ups were interviews with both Rogerson and Smith in prison in 2015. Rogerson admitted he had been to WA a couple of times and Bernie Johnson had looked after him while he was here. But he said he could not recall meeting Shirley Finn. Nettie Smith swore blind he had never even been to WA, never heard of Shirley Finn, but by that time was riddled with Parkinson's disease and dementia. While the evidence does not allow for a finding that Mr Smith killed Miss Finn, it remains an open possibility that he did so. That was Coroner Barry King's conclusion. Duncan, yeah. all your writings suggest that Rogerson and Smith didn't yeah. meet until 1976, which is a year after the Finn murder. Yep. But that doesn't mean they weren't operating in the same circles. 
Oh, look, it's quite likely Rogers and Mason are involved in um, it's the unhold up squad then. Nettie was also doing unhold ups left, right, and centre. Um, I remember actually reading a lot of Nettie's stuff quite some time ago. Nettie, I'd almost inclined to think that Nettie might have been accidentally telling the truth. Um, I don't. I could never see any suggestion he went to Perth. He was the sort of bloke who, for a holiday, would go up to the central coast, a hundred kilometres from Sydney. Um, he wasn't terribly adventurous. The Gold Coast would be a, almost too far. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, look, it's an interesting theory, I suppose, and you you certainly wouldn't dismiss it either. But Roger was still not on the straight and narrow, but oh, let me go back to those. Those visits to Perth were quite common. There was exchange duty. Um, my recollection of exchange duty is when you'd arrive at the airport, you'd be picked up by the squad you're exchanged to, and you'd be drunk for the next week and then get back on the plane. <laughs> um, that's And that... Those drunken things would include visits to casinos and brothels, which of course didn't exist. Um, it was a social event for the coppers and from both states. Um, later in his career, sure, I, I just like to see actually hard evidence that someone told the cops that Nettie Smith and Roger were actually seen mm. at that time. Um, mm. And that's, uh, that's where these old crimes are so bloody tricky. Chronology is an imperative but also documentation to back up the chronology is a real problem. Mm. Um, having a hitter from coming across from East, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, smart move by whoever arranged it. I'm always astounded that they say the West, this, the West Australian police may have been not right back in those days. What a load of bullshit. <laughs> um, every police force in Australia was bent as all get out. Some were better at it than others. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's interesting to put it mildly. And if you're in vice, God almighty, rivers of gold, um, certainly my experiences with WA policing over the years haven't suggested they were scrupulous in how they conducted their business. That's yeah. not the story. Um, yeah, I, look, I'd, I'd be surprised if Rogerson and Smith could really be put into the fit of it. Wouldn't dismiss it at all because these things are so odd. The prospect of someone hiring, a, for example, a bent copper hiring someone from New South Wales, sure. And the fastest way to do that would have been a chat with one of your mates from New South Wales to say, who's about mm. because Sydney back in those days too there are quite a number of very competent well-priced assassins kicking around this is before Chris Flannery and I can think of a few old codgers who would quite happily fly across to Perth do the job take the next plane out smart way to do your business mm. uh, you've immediately put an entire country between the two of you and if the investigating officers are possibly not investigating with full vigour back in those days what a surprise and of course those secrets are now gone with Rogerson, if he ever held them at all. But there was obviously very many secrets, as we mentioned earlier, that he did hold. Yeah. That, uh, he refused to give up right to the end. Yeah, probably vague memory. When I spoke to him in prison about 2018 from memory, and we were talking mm -hmm. about his appeal, but the Shirley Finn thing did come up. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, mate, and it was something on those, oh, mate, I don't know anything about that. Jeez, I went there and we're on the church for a couple of days. <laughs> um, not that Rogerson was ever known for telling the truth. He could lie magnificent. But yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't discount the possibility of their involvement, but I have a suspicion that it was probably others that did the job somehow. It's mm. and just as a on a, a bloodthirsty note, four bullets to the head. Rogerson was always preferred two close shots to the chest. And pretty mm. much everyone that we know he actually shot shot the same way. And that's also very common police business. You fire two shots. It's a bit like the military with a double tap. You fire fire one and one immediately there afterwards. Four is four is expensive. Not the bullet. <laughs> but that if if it was too close group to the chest, the biggest the biggest the centre mass, that would be interesting to put it mildly. That would that would raise my level of interest a little bit more. Well, Duncan, I know it's been a massive busy week uh, for you. So thanks so much for sparing some more valuable time on Court in the Act this week. And uh, a little birdie tells me that you've also been busy writing as well as speaking. And there's going to be uh, an addendum to your uh, Rogers Rogerson book um, regarding his, uh, his end of life. A couple. I had to remind myself how to write earlier this week. So, yes, there's an additional chapter to bring the old book the 2016 book for them up to speed and my dear publishers at Hachette will be popping that out very very soon refreshed and ready to go one more time 
Well, I'm sure all of our listeners will, if they haven't read the book before, uh, be rushing out to buy it now and uh, new chapter and all. So once again, thanks, Duncan. Really appreciate it. And thanks, listeners, again for joining uh, Caught in the Act. Uh, any questions or suggestions, obviously, send them through to Caught in the Act at wanews.com.au. And remember, if you want to know what's going on in court, don't get caught short, get caught in the act instead. See you next week. We'll be right back.